Well, good morning. Great to see all of you here. Great to bring three people into the membership of the church as well. For the past three weeks, I've preached on the saving graces of repentance unto life and saving faith. And during that preaching, what was taught is that faith and repentance are always in the child of God. Both are necessary in order for someone to be saved from judgment to come. And both springs from God's love and his favor and his kindness to sinners, and not based upon any goodness in them. And the primary means of these graces of repentance and faith is the preaching of the word of God. Today's sermon is on sermons, preaching on preaching. Some may ask, what was the sermon about? Well, the preacher preached about preaching. Now, before you check out, concluding that this message will probably have no bearing on your life or on your soul, since you're probably never, ever going to preach, the majority of you. And granted, I had in mind everyone when I put this message together. I have my fellow pastors in mind. I have those of you that are going to be teaching Sunday school. Uh, those fathers that teach their wives and their children. Uh, those men and women that teach Bible studies. Uh, women teaching younger women to love their husbands as well as their children. As well as any type of influence that we have with others, I had all of you in mind, and especially those of us that hear, because you can't talk about preaching without talking about hearing as well. Now, I have a lot of verses, and I've made it very convenient for you, because in your handout, those verses are there for your review. You won't have to flip to the, through your Bibles as I'm going through these verses. They're there for your review Hopefully, you will be able to follow along without having to open your Bibles because I will basically quote from that. Now, this is a topical message. And just to kind of let you know something, I am not used to preaching topical messages. I went back over my sermons over the last years. There's a lot of them. And I've only one time preached a topical message. That was about 30 years ago. It was against false religion. So I'm... I'm not used to this. I'm used to more of an expositional type of approach to preaching. So I'm in the same boat as you are. I'm in uncharted waters in one sense. The last time I did this was 30 years ago. I was much better looking back then. He asked my wife. But anyway, be that as it may, there's four verses that are there in your bulletin. And I'll go ahead and briefly read them and briefly ex ex just ex explain them ever so briefly in regards to preaching. In Titus... Chapter 1, Paul is writing to Pastor Titus, and what he's bringing out to Titus is that the salvation that God has promised has been unrevealed, but now it's going to be revealed, it's manifested in verse 3, in due time manifested his word or his salvation through preaching. Now, if you're in your Bibles, and if not, that's fine. If you go over to 2 Timothy chapter 4, and Paul is now giving Pastor Timothy an exhortation, a very solemn charge in the light of the judgment of God, in the light of the gospel of Jesus Christ. He says in verse 2, preach the word, be ready in season, be ready out of season. Okay, that's for the preachers. Now there's two other verses that I have listed there in Luke 8.18 8, and Mark 4.9, which our Lord is saying in both those passages is, Take heed with how you hear, and he who has ears to hear, let him hear. Now, over the 42 years that my wife and I have professed faith in Jesus Christ, it appears that preaching has become unpopular in many churches. Preaching has been replaced by multiple praise songs that go on between 45 and to 60 minutes, with 15 minutes left over for a little sermonette. Preaching has taken a backseat to theatrical scenes, dramatic Hollywood approaches, 
where the preaching is moved out of the way and what's put in its place are skits and plays. There's even stand-up Christian comedians. On the other end of the spectrum, when I was growing up as a Roman Catholic, attending Mass every Sunday, I snoozed through the most painful, boring exercise of a Latin Mass. Before Vatican I, everything was in Latin, except for the homily. And our priests were from Ireland, right off the boat. You could barely understand them. And they preached for maybe about 10 minutes. Preach, I use the word preach lightly. They're homilies, whatever you want to call them, for about 10 minutes. And I snoozed through that as well. And if that unmarried man went on for more than 10 minutes, he was going to hear about it from his congregation. The Protestant Reformation brought gospel preaching to the forefront of Lord's Day services every Sunday. The Protestant Reformation it had to take, so to speak, to resurrect preaching in churches. But regardless of God's blessing on gospel preaching, many churches conclude that preaching is outdated, it's old-fashioned, Besides, preaching puts people to sleep. Some reason, hey, they're used to a show, let's give them one. Now, there have been a lot of bad sermons that have been preached throughout our nation. My wife and I have had to suffer through some of them in other churches before we came to our first church in um, Lake Forest and eventually coming here, but we had to endure a lot of bad sermons. So, in one sense, many professing Christians got tired of those bad sermons. They started looking elsewhere. It appears that many churches' pastors seem to have lost their heart, lost their focus, lost their force, and maybe even on that same, on that great day of judgment, some will be deemed unconverted. Unconverted ministers, can you imagine that? Incredible. It's an ugly scene for a man or a woman preachers to drone on and on while the majority of the hearers are disinterested or asleep. Now, before the Great Awakening of the 1700s, there was a cartoon of the 1700s, and here was a picture of a preacher preaching to his congregation with everyone asleep with their mouths open. That's the way it was before 1741 when Jonathan Edwards preached his sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God, and God used that to revive our nation back in 1741. But the bottom line is preaching is a mercy of God which is ignored by many church leaders under the pressure by the God of popularity. We don't want to lose our people. Let's give them what they want. Now, I am aware that I'm in a church that teaches and practices the, the supremacy of preaching. I know that I do not need to convince you of the necessity of preaching. You know of the blessing of God in preaching. As our faith is increased by the preaching of God's word, our love and devotion to God is increased by the preaching of God's word. It is that vehicle that God uses, preaching, to help sinners come to faith in Jesus Christ as well as to cause those of us to grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, by definition, preaching is one who stands and heralds. He gives a proclamation. He gives a message. It's a message from God, and it's news to God's people. It's man's encounter with the living God when the word of God is indeed preached. In the Old Testament, Ecclesiastes, if you will, is one who stands before an assembly and addresses an assembly. Now, preaching has developed 
quite a bit. When you consider probably our first example of preaching was Noah. He was a preacher of righteousness, and according to Second Peter, his message would appear to be very, very short. You're all going to be doomed. And even though his hearers heard him, they didn't believe him, and they perished in the flood. You have the book of Deuteronomy, which appears to be a series of sermons by Moses. You have Solomon addressing Israel in a sermon with the uh, temple that was just been built. Book of Ecclesiastes appears to be a book full of sermons. You have the major prophets and the minor prophets. All of those appear to be sermons. Remember Jonah? His sermon to the Ninevites, 40 days and you shall perish. Preaching has developed quite a bit. You have John the Baptist who preached a baptism of repentance. And of course, our Lord Jesus Christ, the greatest preacher, preached multiple sermons. Sermon on the Mount. So we're in the seed. That is what our Lord was doing. He came to preach and he caused his apostles and he sent them out to preach. And even the verse that I mentioned there in 2 Timothy was to preach the word. God's word is very clear on preaching from the Old Testament as well as the New Testament. God says a lot about preaching. There are volumes in this book regarding preaching. Now, my attempt here is not to be exhaustive and to go through every one of those 66 books of the Bible, but my hope is to be direct and to the point and not to put you to sleep, or I will go against what I've just preached. So I have three points. Here's my first point. First point is the relationship between the preacher and the hearer. There's a relationship that I have with you, and it is special and it is unique, and it is quite different. Ministers at times have to bring bad news to you. Sometimes our message is not very welcoming. I'm certain over the years that I have preached to you, I am certain I brought out things that were not welcomed by you. I preached a couple weeks ago that if you're not sick, you've not been exposed, you need to be in church, and I preach that passage from Hebrews, not to forsake the assembling of themselves. I'm certain many of you may have received it, some of you may, to, may not have received it, but it's kind of an interesting relationship we have because usually when someone gives a speech to someone, they want to be accepted by someone, so they tell them what they want to hear. The minister, in one sense, is an enemy at the beginning, preaching a condemning law, and he becomes your friend when he brings you comfort. There is wounding in the preaching and there is healing in the same exercise. The command from God's word is to take heed with how you hear. There's also the command from God's word that it is profitable for doctrine. We like that. Oh, he's going to preach doctrine? Great. Reproof? Wait a minute. Who wants to be reproved? Who am I to tell you what to do, right? Let's continue on in 2 Timothy 3.16. That's what I'm quoting. Correction. Reproof and correction by the minister for instruction in righteousness. How can you and I profit from this exchange? Well, there's got to be a clear understanding of what we are both doing. Something done by the preacher? I'm not to bring you dead sermons. Now, there is the assumption that only I'm the one that's engaged when I'm preaching. That's the assumption. I preach, you react. But the common error in preaching, as well as those who are sitting here, is that you are passive. You are passive. Only the preacher is active. That's the assumption that is wrong. A mighty preacher should have a lively assembly. That is a beautiful exchange. Notice I've used the word exchange. There's something that goes on between me and you in the preaching of God's word. Preaching of the word of God aided by the Holy Spirit demonstrates God's power on both sides of the pulpit. You are not in a coma. You are to be receptive. You are to be believing these truths that are brought out. 
Even if these words warn, they might hurt, they might rebuke and discipline and hurt, and eventually they bring comfort, encouragement, building up, and an increase of your faith. The preacher bringing out things to his congregation that he may not be welcome, but he does it anyway, like I said, appears to be an enemy, and then at the end, he becomes your friend. The preacher also hears what he preaches. He must be a doer of this word. No hypocrisy on this end of the pulpit. There should be sincerity. It's something that the preacher has worked through within his soul. He believes it, and he's bringing it to you. We believe this. This is what that exchange goes on with the preacher. So faithful preaching should be faithfully received by you. Take heed with how you hear. My second point is there should be perfection in the preacher. Now you may be thinking, okay, you're dealing with the preacher again. Well, I'm also dealing with Sunday school teachers. I'm dealing with those that teach studies. But primarily I'm dealing with me right now. I think you'll see the benefit of it. The duty of the minister is to train his mind and his soul that his preaching must be perfect. I must be perfect here in this pulpit. What do I mean by that? My message should be plain, should be understood, should be compelling, it should be united. That's on me. I must be perfect. I must not settle for less. If I do settle for less, then I will become accustomed to preaching mediocre messages. My preaching, also in the area of being understood, is that it must make sense. What I preach to you has got to make sense. In the book of Nehemiah 8.8, 8, Ezra very interesting how he is described there. He is described as one who must read distinctly and directly and to give the sense of the law of God, helping those that heard to understand. God never bypasses the mind in order to hit your heart. It's got to make sense. I have got to make sense in my preaching. That's not easy to understand. It's not easy to make something that's packed to unpack it so that it's understandable to you. But that's on me. And I would submit to you the way that that's accomplished is by an economy of words. The most amount of efficiency with the least amount of words. As opposed to the most amount of words with the least amount of efficiency. It's our duty behind this pulpit is to use a short amount of words that make sense to those who are under the preaching of God's word. Paul said it best in 1 Corinthians 14, 19. In your notes, it says 2 Corinthians 14, 19. There's no 2 Corinthians 14. 2 Corinthians ends at 13. That's my mistake. I gave the wrong information to Nancy. That's on me. Okay, I've enough said about that. But this is what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 14, 19. He says, I would rather speak five words with understanding than 10,000 words in an unknown tongue. Direct, to the point. Don't preach him into the spirit and then preach him out of the spirit. Spurgeon says, if you can't preach what you're supposed to preach in 45 minutes, chances are 15 more minutes is not going to make a difference. Paul also said in 1 Corinthians 14, unless you utter by the tongue words easy to understand, how will it be known what is spoken? Now you may say, what does this have to do with me? Remember the Ethiopian eunuch? He's reading from Isaiah in the book of Acts. Now some would say, all you need to do is just read the word of God and God can use that to save you. And there's a truth to that. That does indeed happen. But that's not the normal means. Ethiopian eunuch is in the chariot. He's reading from the book of Isaiah. God the Holy Spirit could have taken that word at that time and converted him, but he didn't. He commanded Paul, a Paul, Philip, to go and overtake this man. He does. He sees the Ethiopian eunuch reading from Isaiah. 
Do you understand what you're reading? The man says, how can I understand it unless someone guides me? Brethren, this may be for preachers also, for all of us to be able to explain the gospel to other people in a very direct way that they can actually understand what you're talking about. Short and direct and to the point. All preachers, all teachers also should know their audience. They should know their audience. Can they understand what I'm going to say? I have two examples for you. Remember when Peter preached in Acts chapter 2? He knew that they had murdered the Lord Jesus Christ. And what did he preach about? He preached about them murdering the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, keep that in mind. Paul, Acts 17, Mars Hill. He is provoked by all the idolatry that's around him. And what does he preach to them about? He knows his audience. They're idolaters. He preaches against idolatry. Now imagine, if Peter were to take Paul's message about idolatry to these Jews, it would make no sense whatsoever. They, idolatry, we don't bow down to a bunch of stones. Now imagine Paul taking Peter's message of murdering the Lord Jesus to those idolaters on Mars Hill. It makes no sense to them whatsoever. I guess we murdered him. I don't know. But if you talk to them about their idolatry, different story. A master of knowing their audience was our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. When he saw the Pharisees in his audience, he called them hypocrites. How can you, being evil, escape the judgment of God? He knew his audience, but our also, also our Lord knew that those who were convicted of their sins, he says, come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, come to me, I will give you rest. It's important for us if we're going to preach, if we're going to teach to know our audience. I probably would not preach this message at the youth formal. If we're having the beach camp with the kids, chances are I'm probably not going to break out John Owen and start reading to them. If you're teaching your children in your family devotions, I bet you're not going to break out Bunyan and read through it in his 1500 English lifestyle, right? You're going to know who your audience is. You're going to teach to your audience based upon their understanding. And then based on that, there should be some type of interaction between preacher and hearers. There should be a connection with one another. The preacher should be able to connect with you and you connect with the preacher. And this is a little bit off topic, but I can somehow some way connect the dots here. But as a church, while the preacher has a unique relationship with you, you with me, and while the preacher needs to be perfect in his preaching, there's also the life of the church that you're hoping to see through the preaching of the word of God. We are to greet one another. We are to be, have a friendly relationship with one another. The amount of times that John says to greet one another, or Paul gives the command to the church to greet one another, now granted, in that social environment, it was a holy kiss. My holy kiss is going to my wife. Not to you, but there should be some greeting. There should be some connection there with the preacher being perfect as well as his congregation. We should be able to connect with the older people. Hey, I fall in that category now. I'll be 69. As well as those that are middle age, as well as our children. Right, kids? When I'm preaching, I should be able to connect to you somehow, some way. Got to. That's my job. That's my duty. Preachers must be perfect. They've got to be able to connect with their audience somehow, some way. If I put you to sleep, that's my fault, and I regret that. Here's my third point. A question that should provoke all of us. A question that should provoke all of us. And it's found in the book of Jeremiah, verse 29. You don't need to turn there. I will just quote it. In verse 29, the Lord asks a question. He says, is not my word like a fire and a hammer? Think about that for a moment. Is not God's word a fire and a hammer? What effect does fire have on those that are touched by it? Or the hammer 
to a hard heart. Does this not teach that the word preach hurts, burns, and hinders you from doing something? Sleeping. Sleeping. It should be compelling fire. Remember Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12? Is not the word of God sharper than any two-edged sword? They use the word sword for a reason. He didn't say a butter knife. He said a sword. Piercing even to the division of soul and spirit. The word of God goes right through us. Right through our affections as well as our mind. What kind of preaching affects both our minds and our heart, our emotions, our intellect and our feelings? Remember this, our God is a living God. Jeremiah 10, 10. The Lord is the true God, God of truth. He is the living God, the everlasting King. Matthew 16, 16, when... Peter was asked about the identity of the Lord Jesus Christ. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. Living God. To speak of preaching or to preach as nothing more than a mere exercise of the mind without considering God is fatal. A message Without God? Is God in the preaching? And if so, what is God like? Does God love? Does he hate? Does he love righteousness and abhor wickedness? Now some religions have a God who's far away, not preserving and governing all of his creatures and all of their actions. He is not near to each one of us. He does not know our thoughts. He does not see our actions. He does not see our sins. Is that really God? Is that the God of the scriptures? Our God fills the heavens and the earth. Does God love righteousness and hate wickedness? Does God know every small molecule and thought and intent of the heart of man? There must be indeed faithful preaching, but it must be the preaching of God the Lord that will affect our minds as well as our hearts. The living God implies life. Life. And he is a God of truth. There's an intellect there, and I have to be careful because I'm going to start talking about God, and you're going to start saying, this sounds like a person. Well, God indeed is a person, He's immutable, he's unchangeable, but does God have these attributes of love and hate? Does he have the attribute of favor and vengeance and wrath? God is indeed unchangeable, he's not a man, but we must not allow that doctrine to explain away God's love as well as his hate, his anger and his mercy. Remember, God is angry with the wicked every day. Psalm 711 brings that out. If you remove the attributes of his love and his anger and his kindness and his mercy and his wrath, all you have is a system of rules and regulations. And if all you have is a God that's emotional, take away truth, all you have is nothing more than a mystical, sentimental, changeable God. In the scriptures, God is revealed as truth, as well as his attributes of love, 
of anger, of vengeance, as well as mercy. We must not explain away God's word as God's word describes God for what he is and how he approaches the righteous as well as the unrighteous. God loves the righteous, but he's angry with the wicked every day. God is love, but he's also a consuming fire. And in that same book, it says it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Remember I mentioned earlier Jonathan Edwards? I may have mentioned him earlier. Sinners in the hands of an angry God. God used that to bring a nation to its knees. Psalm 5.5, 5, I'm not going to apologize for what I'm about to say. This is, I'm just basically quoting scripture. It says that God hates all workers of iniquity. He also said, Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated. And that's quoted in Malachi chapter 1. Now some would say, well, wait a minute, you've got to explain the context of Malachi chapter 1. Great, let's look at Malachi chapter 1. You can look at it or just listen. Listen to the Lord, how, he's, how he explains the fact that Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated. I laid waste his mountains and his heritage. Who's that? That's all the Edomites that were the mortal enemies of the, of the people of God. They may build, he says, but I will throw down. They shall be called the territory of wickedness and the people against whom the Lord will have indignation forever. God, for lack of a better term, our confession uses the word subsistence. Our, our um, catechism uses the word person. But God is a person. He's personal. He has the attributes of love and hate and favor and anger. It's all within the boundaries of God's word. But for God to love and hate, these attributes are on display in God's word. And they are necessary for him to be a person. If God cannot love or hate, it makes God not a person, not the true and the living God. For God to be indifferent in hatred means he's got to be indifferent with regards to love. He loves good, but he's got to hate evil. The one who loves goodness, it flows out of a hatred for evil. The one who loves purity has got to hate sexual immorality. The God who loves truth has got to hate lying. And the God who loves life has got to hate murder. And I add abortion. Can you imagine a judge letting a convicted felon go free after he has butchered a father and a mother and children? That would show a complete lack of love for justice and a lack of love for that butchered family and a hatred for justice. Justice is still good. God is still infinitely just. Hatred of evil springs from a love of righteousness. If you love life, you're going to hate death. There is no middle ground. And to say that God neither loves righteousness nor hates wickedness, it falls short of who God is. It makes no sense to preach some of his attributes and to leave his other attributes, his negative ones, ignored. Think of this. Did not the Lord express his love for his son after he was baptized and said, this, he, he, this is rare whenever God speaks this way. He spoke loudly. He said, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. In fact, he said, this is my beloved son. Now, Herod butchers John the Baptist, takes his head off. And in the book of Acts, he is violent against the church. And God sends an angel to him and kills him right there on the spot. My question to you is, is God indifferent on those particular occasions? We quote, quote John 3.16, and we should, but we should keep on reading because the one who does not believe is condemned already. And when you go to the very last verse of John chapter 3, what is it? The wrath of God abides on him. Is not the wrath of God revealed from heaven 
against all ungodliness in Romans chapter 1. All those sins, that long list of sins that are practiced by mankind. Did not the sins of Noah's day and the depravity, the depravity of Sodom merit the anger and judgment of God? Or was God indifferent? Now, I've gone on long here. And some of you may be, may be thinking, why are you going to such great lengths in this part of the message? Is this not overwhelming? Is this not imbalanced? I use the word love and hate. I use the word favor and vengeance. And probably all that some of you may have heard was hate and vengeance. the preacher as well as the hearers must be convinced of the truth of God's awful judgment. I use the word awful in that awe of God in such a way that we are silent. Should there not be on the part of the preacher as well as those that hear a sense of sin, a hatred of sin, sin along with God's goodness, he causes the rain, his blessing to fall on the just and the unjust. But the preacher and the congregation must see that God is infinitely holy. He cannot tolerate sin. The preacher may stutter his way through the law, which reveals the very character of God. And there may be a sense of, and conviction of sin. Remember, this is not popular. Men want to be told what they want to hear, make us feel better about ourselves. But the preaching is to penetrate the soul of the hearer's mind as well as his affections to where you are aroused to say, what must I do? Or hand over the mouth saying, behold, I am vile. Now, we have God on one side of the pulpit and you on the other side of the pulpit meeting on this preaching stage. An offended God. We have God as one, man on the other. One is infinitely holy, the other one is guilty. Responsible for all of our actions, all of our thoughts. His guilt for saints as well as for sinners. The knowledge of God and his law is an encounter with the living God. It brings about conviction of sin as God must be preached. And remember Isaiah? This is a converted man. When he saw the Lord, what did he say? In all of his majesty, woe is me for I'm a man of unclean lips. If God's holiness is diminished in preaching, so does man's guilt decrease until it eventually disappears. It is more popular and easier to ignore God and his law and to turn God's wrath into nothing more than a metaphor and something not to be taken seriously. Diminish human guilt and conviction of sin and the hearers will see no need to be forgiven. Instead of faithful preaching, the strength of the message loses its force. Remember in the Old Covenant, there was a constant reminder of guilt by the sacrifice that was authorized by God, carried out by the priests. Christ's atonement does away with that. Those sacrifices could never take away sin. Christ does. Christ's death on the cross atoned for sin takes away guilt and gives relief and comfort to the Christian. In the new covenant, we've got to at least understand who Christ is. Think of this. The infinite becomes finite. God becomes man and yet he's still God and man. I can't even, I'm too poor to even try to describe that wonderful mystery of Christ becoming God. He had to though because of the terrible plight that man was in because of his sin. But Christ came, 
had had all the attributes of man. He wept. He was grieved. He was weary. He had joy. He enjoyed the friendship with his apostles. He had the love of the Father. But he was also God. God in human flesh, unchangeable, infinite, and eternal. How do we even come close to understanding that? But Christ must be preached. And all we can do is say, yes, I believe. That's all we can say is we believe. I don't perfectly understand it. No one does. It's incomprehensible according to our confession of faith. But not only who Christ is, but what did he accomplish? What did he die for? Did he cover any sin whatsoever? He did. Now the sinner, now the saint, we are remorseful, we are repentant. Even though it appears sometimes the guilt is eating us up, we believe upon the Son of God, the payment that he made for the crimes that we committed against our God. Now this goodness of God leads us to repentance. Now remember, that was written to a Christian church, that passage, as well as leading us to faith in Jesus Christ, a constant renewing of our peace with God by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. This is a good effect now upon the convicted sinner who is now believing upon Christ. Christ's preach brings relief to the hearers. The burden, the guilty soul, finds a connection between the sense of sin and what Christ did to atone for that sin. A great cost was paid. Remember what our Lord suffered when he went to the cross. All the sins of his elect were placed to his account. And God's wrath, his anger, burned against his son to make payment for that sin. I was trying to think of an earthly illustration that would somewhat make sense. It was hard. I remember something like about 31 years ago, we heard a man preaching. Hopefully this makes sense. But back in the day when I was in high school, we used to run out there in the, I was on the cross country team, horrible run. I was a horrible runner. They timed me with a calendar. I was horrible. But there, there's these there's burn areas out there. And what they would do is have what they call a controlled burn that the fire department would do. They'd take all this dead uh, grass and they would, and it was, and we're talking acres and they would do a controlled burn. Why would they do that? So when the big fire did come and it would hit that particular area, it wouldn't, it wouldn't uh, burn that area. It would, in one sense, go out, okay? Now take this to the example I'm trying to bring out, and that is God's wrath, his anger, his fire landed on his, the land of his son. And all of us that are in Christ do not have to fear for the wrath of God to land on us because it landed on his son. Justice is not going to come back to our Lord a second time. It already did one time. All of us that are in him are forgiven of our sins. They will not burn on us again. We hunger and we thirst after righteousness and Christ feeds us. He gives us his very own blood. This is truly good news because the wrath of God is now turned away. Guilt, relief, faith increases and rests upon Jesus Christ. Divine justice offended, and yet Christ pacifies it. Pacifies it. The preaching of the gospel is personal. It's got to be. We're not talking mere theories like words that are scratched on a chalkboard. We're sitting in a service, making our notes, like we're at a history class, making sure we get the right answer when the test comes along. It's good to take notes. I'm not poo-pooing taking notes. But we need to be careful that conviction of sin stays out there while we're taking our notes. We need to make sure that we are Affected. Can you imagine conviction of sin outside of the sinner? It doesn't touch his soul. But remember, the word of God is a fire. It is a hammer. When you look at the epistles, you see how Paul has to deal with the churches. The Corinthian church comes to mind, of course, with their immorality, getting drunk at the Lord's Supper, suing one another, even the false doctrine that there is no resurrection 
Paul had to deal with that church directly. That sermon was read and preached to them, and probably a different sermon would go to the Thessalonian church, who was suffering great persecution, and they were granted comfort. All that comes about, the preaching of the word of God, brings about the comfort of the Lord Jesus Christ. So in conclusion, the preacher and his congregation, if there's a pointless, dull address, laziness between the preacher and the hearer, both are at fault. However, if I put you to sleep, that's my fault. The buck stops right here at this pulpit. It stops with me if I am dull and lazy. Do you not see a great need for God the Holy Spirit to place an imprint on the pastor's soul as well as all of yours? Do you see that great need? Upon preacher in here, the truth of God as well as his, I've gone to great lengths to bring out God's disapproval of sin. That's why I went to such great lengths about that. That's not preached very much these days in many churches. I've heard the sermons. But there should be this holy reverence and fear towards God. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. It brings about a reverence. God's truth is preached. Our joy increases we see the Lord Jesus Christ sacrificed in plain view in the church. We have the victory of the Lord Jesus Christ at the cross, at the resurrection. And God's people are comforted and encouraged by this message because they are convinced of their own personal sin. My application, my dear people, be here. Be here every Sunday. Sit under the preaching of God's word. Hear attentively. Hear lively. Hear joyfully. And pray. Pray. This should cause us to pray for preacher and ourselves. Just see the great dependence that we have upon the Lord to bless the preaching. A preacher is called to do something impossible. I've got to represent God, and I've got to be perfect. And you must take heed with how you hear. And this can't be done in and of ourselves. We must pray, brethren. Pray fervently. Pray believing. Pray often with confidence that God does indeed hear us. Now, what kind of year are we going to have behind this pulpit? What kind of year are you going to have in that pew? Preach the word. Take heed with how you hear. Let's pray. <coughs> our Heavenly Father, we come to you thankful that our prayers are no longer an abomination in your sight, but they are your delight. We give you thanks and praise you for the mercy that you've shown to us in your Son. And our prayer, Father, is for any here that are outside of grace that you would show mercy, show them their great need to be reconciled unto you, that you do not approve of, countenance, show any favor, but you're angry with the wicked every day. Have mercy upon these, O oh Father, through the preaching of your word. We thank you that we have a place to come to to hear your word. And we pray that you might seal these words to our very own souls. Do good to us the rest of this day. Cause your son to be glorified in our midst and answer our prayers. Accept our worship, even in the preaching of your word, for we pray in Jesus' name.